Well, I didn't quite finish my uh, first presentation in the last hour, so I'll kind of wrap that up now with a story. I told you I was going to tell you a story that, that relates to these little prayers of trust. And um, this is a true story uh, that happened um, somewhat early in my vocation, but uh, when I began, I was with a, a certain Franciscan group, and um, I grew up in a Franciscan parish, an Italian parish um, in Hudson, New York, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and the uh, OFM uh, ran that parish for many years. So it was rather natural for me to go to the Franciscans when I uh, began in my vocation. Um, and I, the Franciscans are a wonderful religious order, and I love them dearly. And I went through a couple of years, and I was getting right, just about ready uh, to make my first profession of vows. And unfortunately, there was uh, something going on that distressed me very much. Now, I was pretty much the same back then as I am now, but I was a novice. And novices are better seen than heard, like children, you know? So what happened was, <clears throat> apparently some of the priests, and they knew better, they're, they're old enough to know better, they, they, weren't, they weren't young, some of them we're not purifying the sacred vessels after Mass. Um, you know what that means, purifying the vessels? The chalice may have some of the precious blood in it a little bit, and, and there's some particles or, or fragments of the consecrated host on the paten. And the priest is supposed to, what we call purify, he, he's supposed to uh, wash the vessels, consume what's left of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, out of reverence, you know. I mean, it's Jesus. Well, some of them, uh, I, I asked, they weren't doing it. And I asked, well, why aren't they doing that? And then one of, the, uh, one of them said, well, Vatican II changed that. It's not Jesus anymore after Mass. Now, I hadn't gone through the seminary yet and wasn't a theologian, uh, but, you know, my grandmother knew that. And... and um, I said, no, 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 that's baloney, you know, that, that's not true. I mean, it's either Jesus or it isn't. And there was a, a, a kind of an argument that went on for a while, they, and they didn't do it. And so I would sneak into the sacristy and purify the sacred vessels. One day I went in, and I had this, I'll call it an inspiration. Uh, there, there on the credence table were the sacred vessels, the, the chalice and the paten. And sure enough, there were fragments uh, of the consecrated host, and there was some of the precious blood in the chalice. Jesus, in other words. That is Jesus Christ. That is our faith. Under the appearance of bread and wine, that is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. That's the doctrine of our faith. You either believe that and believe what the Catholic Church teaches or not. And if you don't, well, that's heresy. Now, I went in, and sure enough, there's Jesus. And so I said, hmm, there's the Lord. Um, and, and I happened to see over on the other table the candles for benediction. And so it was almost like a cartoon, you know, where the idea pops up in the guy's head. So I took the big candelabras with the benediction candles, six candles in each one, and I set them on the table where, where the vessels were, and I lit all the candles. And then I knelt down in front of the uh, Blessed Sacrament and the lit candles, he said, well, um, somebody ought to do it, so I'll make a holy hour. And the provincial happened to be visiting. And he walked into the sacristy, and he sees me kneeling down, and, and the, the, the chalice and the patent there with all the candles lit. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, you all left Jesus in the sacred vessel. I thought I'd kneel down and make a holy hour, or somebody ought to. Well, that was the beginning of my end. The next day, the novice master came to me and said, Father Provincial has accepted your resignation. You have an hour to pack. And they shipped me out, sent me home. 
and it broke my heart. When I took off the Franciscan habit, it was like ripping off my skin. I think St. Joseph of Cupertino said that when, they, when, when, he, when he had to leave, I believe, the Capuchins. Uh, he said it was like ripping off my skin to take off the habit. Yeah, it was a long ride from Maine to New York, and I got there total desolation. I can't even describe it to you. It was Gethsemane. Ab absolute agony. You see, for two years in novitiate, my cell, my room, was right next to the novitiate chapel. And where I laid my head down, it was, the bed was next to the wall, and exactly on the other side of the wall was the tabernacle. And so for two years, every night, I slept with my head this close to Jesus reserved in the tabernacle. And I had a very special grace for that two years. Uh, oh, oh, you sense perceptible awareness of the presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And so when I was thrown out, it, it, was, it was ripped from me. It, it was horrible. Gethsemane. Absolute desolation. I couldn't even lie down that first night. I couldn't lie down on my bed. I was so desolate, it's hard to describe it. I, I lay down on the floor of my mother's house, and I couldn't sleep, and it was agony. Early in the morning, the devil came. I've destroyed your vocation. Now I'll destroy you. And I knew he was there to physically kill me. And at that moment, it's hard to describe in words, but it's as if my soul was a place where a lion lived. And from the depths of my soul, the Holy Spirit, like a lion, reared up, grabbed the devil, and hurled him into hell with a power and a violence that's hard to describe in words. And I knew in, a, in an absolute burst of joy that God still loved me, that I hadn't abandoned my vocation. And I knew that I never had to be afraid of the devil because, as St. Paul said, do you not know you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And those words are not mere metaphor. In a very real way, the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son united to him dwell in a soul that lives in a state of grace. But that notwithstanding, I suffered that terrible desolation for the next many days. On the ride home from the monastery, having had to take the habit off and go home as a layperson again, uh, I had the inspiration that I'd actually had in a vision previously. I was crossing a rickety old suspension bridge, the kind they have in South America, across a canyon. It was a rope bridge and very, very shaky. And I was going across, and I got in the middle and froze with fear. I just couldn't go on. And then, from the depths of my soul again, the words, Immaculate Heart of Mary, I place all my trust in you. Those words came up from my soul. They strengthened me and enabled me to finish walking across that bridge. And there the risen Christ, with his arms outstretched, was waiting for me. I had the inspiration that I was to pray that little prayer 1,000 times a day for 33 days. It was an interior inspiration. Immaculate Heart of Mary, I place all my trust in you. Counting it on rosary beads. 1,000 times a day for 33 days. I did it, as well as my other prayers. The last day happened to fall on August 15th. That morning, of course, the solemnity of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin, I went to Mass as usual with my mother. 
we came home and we were having breakfast. The telephone rang and it was the vocation director of Holy Apostle Seminary in Connecticut where I was scheduled to go with the Franciscans. It was the vocation director. And he said, I understand you're not coming. They, you know, you're not with them anymore. And they said well, you wouldn't be coming, but your novice master and your spiritual director said that, that you were a very good candidate for the priesthood and we should accept you. And so I want you to know you have a place here at the seminary. And I said, well, that's wonderful, Father, but I have no money. And at that time, it was $8,000 a year to go to the seminary. And um, he said, well, that's a terrible reason not to be a priest. You have no money. I said, well, can I do it? Go, can I come free? <laughs> and he said, well, no. <laughs> it took a shot anyway, you know. So anyway, he wished me well, and that was it. Five minutes later, the telephone rang again. And it was a man who had been in novitiate with me, who at a certain point in time became very jealous and tried to basically destroy me, tried to get me thrown out. In, in the process, he was thrown out. And he said, for the last month or so, Every morning when I pray the rosary before Mass, your face is in my head. And I want to know what it's doing there. And so I called the monastery to see if you're dead or that I should pray for you or what was going on. And they told me you weren't there anymore, etc. So I had to find out what's going on. Surely of all of us, you have to be a priest. I said, well, thank you, but, you know, I don't know. And uh, there was a pause, and he, find, he said, aha, I know what it is. You need money. You need money to go to the seminary. Come down to Newark right now, and I'll give you all the money you need. I got in the car, my mother's car, drove down to Newark, New Jersey, met him, and he put $8,000 in cash in my hand. And within a week, I was in the seminary. Immaculate Heart of Mary, I place all my trust in you. Easy prayer. Easy prayer for hard times. Those might have been the hardest times of my life. The loss that I had sustained to me was the greatest loss that I'd ever sustained in my life. It seemed like I, I lost my vocation. <clears throat> I, I, I lost the religious habit. Immaculate Heart of Mary, I place all my trust in you. That's easy prayer for hard times. Now don't think that because the prayer is simple, in little, that it's ineffective. Believe me, the saints were simple, and they were little. They became saints. Humility, simplicity, trust, faith, hope, charity, purity, all those things, they tend toward disposing us properly. If you don't have that in place, you can pray until you're blue in the face and nothing's going to happen. You must be well disposed. And that's not hard. That's easy. Be little. Don't try to be big. You know, like Grandma used to say, mm, you're too big for your britches. What? Right? You're proud, boastful. Uh, you're not simple. You're trying to be sophisticated. You know, when I, when I turned 15, a, an interesting thing happened. When I turned 15 years old, having acquired all possible wisdom, <laughs> knowing all things, no one could tell me anything. Too big for my britches. A lot of people are too big for the britches. A lot of learned, so-called learned people become too big for the britches. 
a lot of so-called learned theologians become too big for their britches, they get educated into imbecility. They suffer from arrogance, which is the kiss of death to the spiritual life. If you are not filled with the same Holy Spirit who inspired the sacred word to begin with, no matter how many doctorate degrees you have, you will remain an amateur and an outsider. And the only way you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit is by being well disposed, meaning humble and simple and pure and confident in God, trusting him, having faith and hope and charity. That's not rocket science. That's simple. That's easy. Easy prayer for hard times. And then we should pray simply the scriptures. Having worked on becoming well disposed, and that's a lifelong task. That's a function of the spiritual life. Let me explain what prayer is. Prayer is not merely saying some words. Okay? Uh, well, vocal prayer is important. You know, we learn our prayers when we're children. We, we learn the vocal prayers, the Hail Mary, the Arvind. Now, those are, those are gospel prayer, very important. They remain always powerful and important prayers. And we should always engage in vocal prayer. But it's not all there is. There's also uh, what, what we might call mental prayer or meditative prayer. And, and what do we meditate on? Uh, well, not, not like some fads have it, some mantra, you know, so, some saying, unless it's Jesus, the holy name of Jesus. You have to be centered on Christ, uh, not on something else, not on anything else. Listen, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Center your life on Christ. Jesus, and you will be going in the right direction, always. And I'll give you a shortcut. I'll give you a secret of the spiritual life. It's not really a secret, but since so few people seem to interiorize it, it is a secret in a manner of speaking. If you want to grow intimate with Jesus, you want to become one with Jesus, you want Jesus as the center of your life, Draw close to Mary, our mother. That's the shortcut. I can tell you this. Now, I don't know how, we, none of us really know how we're going to end up. You know, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I hope that it's going to end well for me. Uh, right now, uh, anything can happen. You know, every once in a while when I'm traveling, somebody will stop me, some good Baptist somewhere, and say, are you saved, brother? You know, especially if I'm dressed like this, they'll kind of look you up and down, are you saved, brother? And I'll say, well, brother, when I get there, I'll know. When I get to heaven, I'm saved. And I'm not saved until then. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Am I saved? No, we're to work out our salvation in fear and trembling, as St. Paul said. I'm saved when I get there. When I'm in heaven... Then I can breathe a sigh of relief. Until then, man, I got to work at it. It's not easy. And so we work at it. Pray the scriptures. You must love the Bible. You know, really do this, please. My favorite books, no matter where I go, I have two books. I happen to have one of them up here with me now, but uh, right in my briefcase is the other one, and I'll probably I'll have that one tomorrow. The Bible first, and the Catechism of the Catholic Church second. And the two go very, very much together. The average Catholic should read the Bible. Every one of us should read the Bible every day. Every one of us should know how to read the Bible as the church 
reads the Bible. However, 99.9% .9 of Catholics never heard of it, never heard of the method, the methodology of how we read the Bible. They don't know how. They're like the eunuch from Queen Candace's court. You remember that? When she was, the, the, this, this eunuch was going along in a horse and carriage, and Philip was walking on the, one of the apostles, St. Philip, was walking along the road. And uh, the um, eunuch is reading the, um, the Old Testament. And Philip says, uh, you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, well, no, how can I unless someone teach me? How can I unless someone show me? That's the way it is. It's not your fault. Do you understand divine revelation? It's so fundamental. It's so enormously important. And yet the average priest can't explain it. Why? They don't understand it. Why? They haven't been taught. And there's no excuse for it. One of the primary documents of the Second Vatican Council, one of the two dogmatic constitutions of the Second Vatican Council, is the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation. Enormously important. De Verbum is the name of it. Word of God. How many of you have ever heard of it? A few of you. About 2% of you. About the same percentage that, that knew about that legislation in Congress, you know. But that's how, I don't blame you. You didn't know because nobody told you. It's not your fault. I don't blame you. It's not your fault. Well, when I get done with you, you're not going to be able to plead ignorance. No, you're not going to have comprehensive knowledge of it, but I'm going to give you a place to start. Get the document. You, sh you should all have a copy of the documents of the Second Vatican Council, or at least read it in the Catechism, the section on divine revelation. You know, I'm going to teach you very simply. You know what a good teacher does? I'll tell you something. I had a couple, a few, very few good teachers in my life. I had a lot of adequate teachers, so-so teachers, run-of-the-mill teachers, but I had very few excellent teachers. You know what an excellent teacher does? An excellent teacher conveys the subject matter to the student in a simple, intelligible way such that the student is able to grasp the subject matter. If the subject matter goes over the student's head and they never get it, that's not a good teacher. Well, the kid wasn't paying attention. All right, make them pay attention. You have to be transparent as a teacher. You know, you, you, you ought to be able to present it in such a way that they get it. So that's what I've always tried to do, and I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to teach about divine revelation in the context of prayer, because it's important. It's very simple, right? Easy, easy prayer, not hard, easy. You're all going to get this, and you're going to say, wow, that was easy, because it is. What is divine revelation? Very simple. Divine revelation is the revelation of God our Father. He reveals himself. That's what revelation means. God our Father reveals himself to us in the person of his only word, Jesus. In the eternal silences of the Trinity, God our Father spoke but one word. His eternal word. He has no more to say. Those are the beautiful words of the great doctor of the church, St. John of the Cross. Quoted by the Second Vatican Council, quoted by the Catechism of the Catholic Church. That, that sums up divine revelation. The Father, God our Father, reveals himself to us through his Son. No one has seen the Father except the Son. No one's going to see the Father except through the Son, with the Son, and in the Son. 
by looking at Jesus, we see our Heavenly Father. What is unseen becomes visible. Visible. That's revelation, divine revelation. God our Father reveals himself to us in the person of his Son. His Word. What is the Word of God? You know, people often, this flies over people's head. The average Christian doesn't understand a silly thing about it. A few do, but most don't. If I said, what's the Word of God? Well, it's the Bible. Okay, what, keep going. But the Word of God isn't something. The Word of God is somebody. And his name is Jesus Christ. That's the Word of God. Jesus, right there. Look at Jesus and you will see the Father in the person of Jesus Christ. Every word in the Bible, the Old Testament included, every word in the Bible, every word in the Catechism of the Catholic Church can be condensed, distilled, and synthesized into one alone, one word alone, Jesus, the eternal word. That's the word of God. It's not something. It's somebody. That's divine revelation. The Father reveals himself to us in the person of his Son. Now, that word, Jesus, is revealed to us in three distinct but separate ways. It's a, I'll give you a Trinitarian analogy. If I ask you, how many gods are there? You will say one. There is one God. Correct. How many revelations are there? One. One revelation, because there's only one God. But that one God is three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That one revelation of the one God comes to us in three interconnected, compenetrated ways. Sacred Scripture, you know what that is, the Bible, Sacred Scripture. Sacred tradition, which has equal weight with sacred scripture. And I'll guarantee you, if I come around, none of you will give me the answer to what sacred tradition is. Well, a few of you could, but not many. Sacred scripture, sacred tradition, magisterial teaching, no one of which can subsist without the other two. You cannot have scripture, authentically speaking, without sacred tradition and magisterial teaching. Can you have God, authentically, the real God, can you have God if he's only the Holy Spirit? No, that's incorrect. God is not merely Holy Spirit. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can you have authentic scripture, the word of God, without tradition and magisterial teaching? No, you cannot. Wherever one person of the Blessed Trinity is, there the other two persons must be. Through that reality in, in theology which we call the divine perichoresis or circumcision. Wherever one person of the Trinity is, there the other two are. So wherever you see the Son, you can be sure the Father and the Holy Spirit are there. Wherever the Holy Spirit, there the Father and the Son. Wherever the Father, there's the Son and the Holy Spirit. You can't separate the persons of the Trinity, nor can you separate these inseparable dimensions of divine revelation, scripture, tradition, and magisterial teaching. If you attempt a scripture without tradition, say, and I'm not talking about customs here. This is a technical term. I'll, I'll, I'll define it for you in a minute. You have to have sacred tradition and magisterial teaching in order to have authentic sacred scripture. You can pick up the Bible. One of the people, when I did the catechism series in Sacramento, California, all kinds of people came to that. Buddhists came, Hindus came, Muslims came, Jews came, Baptists, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, you name it, Everybody came, and even three Hell's Angels motorcycle guys came. <laughs> hey, 
everybody came. And one of, the, one of the women who sat in the front row, she came every single Saturday for 12 Saturdays. Her, her name was Ruth. She had, been, she, she had worked in Manhattan in the garment district with her husband for many years. Now, Ruth was a smart woman. And Ruth was an industrious and tough woman. Um, and Ruth lost her husband and, of course, was very saddened by that. They'd been married over 50 years, I think. And Ruth was kind of searching, and she came. I don't know how she heard about it, read it in the paper. Or I don't know. She showed up, though, sat in the first row, and listened to my lectures on the catechism of the Catholic Church. And she decided she would enter the Catholic Church. So she went through the RCIA program, uh, preparing to uh, come into the church at the Easter Vigil. In the course of that preparation, uh, like so many of the RCIA programs, uh, they were kind of light on doctrine. And their concept uh, of this was they'd get around in a circle and they'd read the readings. You know, the RCIA program can be okay, but it's, it's uh, lectionary-based catechesis. Unfortunately, the lectionary does not present the faith in a systematic and organic fashion. The catechism of the Catholic Church does, okay? So, their method was they'd get around a circle, they'd read the readings for that Sunday, and then they would go around and say, now, Joe, what do you think it means? And Joe would give his little interpretation. And then, now, Mary, what do you think it means? Now, isn't that nice? They went around, and they were very inclusive about it. And everybody got to say what they thought it meant. And they came to Ruth, the Jew. And they said, now, Ruth, what do you think it means? And she got very incensed. And she stood up and she said, I came to find out what you people think it means. Never mind what I think it means. And besides, Father Karapi said, <laughs> and since the bishop had appointed me to teach in his diocese, they had to listen, personal interpretation doesn't really matter. That's not how you teach the meaning of sacred scripture. We have principles. They're not hard. They're easy. Okay? Easy. And you can't have the Bible authentically without sacred tradition, magisterial teaching. Well, what's this tradition business? Now, sacred tradition, I, I put it with a capital T, uppercase T. It's the apostolic kerygma. That, now, easy way to understand it. When Jesus Christ walked on the earth, he didn't write a book. He never wrote a book. Jesus never wrote a book. The Bible has God as its primary author. Be sure of that. There's no question about that. God is the primary author of the Bible. That's for sure. But when Jesus walked the earth, he never wrote a book. What did he do? He taught orally. He taught orally. The Holy Spirit worked through him, and he presented the faith orally. He preached. He taught. They called him rabbi. It means teacher. Rabboni. Ah, oh, you call me teacher, and rightly so. He's the only teacher, capital T. What's tradition? It's the oral teaching of Jesus Christ transmitted under the power of the Holy Spirit to his apostles. And then those apostles, under the inspiration of the same Spirit, handed on orally that same teaching in faith and morals they had received from Jesus Christ. Sacred tradition, capital T, not mere customs. Customs come and go. You know, for a while, you can't eat meat on Friday. That, that's a discipline, not a doctrine. Uh, uh, by the way, Friday remains a day of penitential observance, and I'll bet you most of you didn't know that. What you know is, is, is after the council, they said, oh, now you can eat meat. The only thing people got from all the way, oh, now we can eat meat on Friday. Well, that's true. If you want to eat meat on Friday, you can. But you've got to do some other penance. Did you know that? Have you, have you been living since 1968 without knowledge of that, going to church every Sunday, and you don't know that in the Catholic Church to this day, and it doesn't matter if you like it or not. <laughs> Who cares? <You> know? <laughs> 
Friday remains a day of penitential observance in the Catholic Church. Oh, hey, refraining, you know, abstaining from eating meat on Friday is no penance for me. You know, I can suffer with lobster. I can mortify myself with halibut. You know, eh, so what? You know what my, my normal penance on Friday is? I'll, 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 I'll share that with you, you know. We should all have something. Because Friday is a day of penance, not just in Lent. Not just the Fridays of Lent. Every Friday remains a day of penitential observance in the Catholic Church. Well, I'm telling you something a lot of you don't know probably. And you're the, and you're the good folks. You know, <laughs> you're the pillars of the church. And a lot of you don't know this. I usually travel on Friday. I usually am on my way to my mission on Friday. Not every Friday, but throughout the years, usually on Friday, early in the morning, 3 a.m., I get up and go to the joy of airport security. <laughs> I would rather fast on mud and snails than travel by airplane on Friday or any other day. But, so what? You smile and you say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, God gave me some minute thing that I might offer to him. Now maybe you'll go feed the hungry on Fridays. Maybe you'll go visit a nursing home on Fridays. Maybe you'll say some extra prayers, go to Mass, whatever it is. That's up to you. That's your business alone, between you and God. You can do anything you want or refrain from doing anything you want. But you offer something to God. Why? For all Fridays, the day we commemorate the Passion of Christ. And, and, you know, redemption was not an arm's length transaction, to use that term from business. It was an intimate thing between Jesus and the soul. And so we should enter into this. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about the role of penance and sacrifice in, in, in this easy prayer. So, pray the scriptures. Now, it's not rocket science, and you don't have to turn it into rocket science. It's very easy. But in the, in the back of your mind, as a backdrop for it, you ought to know how the Catholic Church reads Scripture. You ought to know that, that it's not about just reading the Bible. It's an approach to divine revelation. And if somebody says, well, what's this divine revelation? That sounds kind of complicated. Nope. Easy. Easy. What's divine revelation? Our Father reveals himself to us in the person of his Son. How do we know the Father? Only through the Son. How do we go to the Father? Only through the Son. That's divine revelation. Simply put, when we read the Bible, how do we interpret it? You know, somebody reads the Bible. I, I remember when I began preaching down in, right after I finished my doctoral studies in Spain, I was down in Pensacola, Florida, and about that time there was a certain Protestant minister down there preaching, supposedly from the Bible, that it was justified to protect unborn children uh, by doing whatever it took to take the doctors who were doing the abortions out of the picture, and two people, two doctors got murdered. And some of it had to do with this guy preaching what well, it says in the Bible. You know, what? No, no. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You know, they're innocent. They can't defend themselves. And so we can defend them. We can kill the doctors. He actually said that. And used the Bible as his source. Wrong. And, but somebody says, yes, but it says in there this, that, uh-uh. There are principles that we use for the interpretation of sacred scripture. They're very simple. Easy. Easy prayer. What are they? Number one, when you read the Bible, when you read scripture, you are to read it 
as a totality. You don't take things out of context. Does it say in the Bible, in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth? Does that mean somebody shoots your brother, you can shoot the other guy's brother? Does it mean that? Does the Bible say that? No. How do we know that? By reading the whole thing. By taking it as a whole, not taking little pieces of it out of context. Okay? Number two. When you read scripture, you must read it in the light of sacred tradition. Now, what's the best way for you to learn what this sacred tradition is? Study the Catechism of the Catholic Church. But you say, I'm too old. Yeah? How old are you? 80? <laughs> Upstart. <laughs> you're not too old. And you're not too young. Can you read? One time a guy thought he had me. I was talking in this vein, and he said, I can't do that. And I said, why not? He said, I can't read. I never learned how to read. And I sympathized with him. That's a, that's a, that's a tough thing. Uh, but I wasn't to be put back by that. Oh, you can't read. I said, um, can you hear? Yes. Can you see? Well, yes. Did you ever watch television? Yes. <laughs> I had them. <laughs> and so he started watching my show on the catechism every Sunday night on EWTN. And he learned his faith. To this day, I'm amazed by this. That, my series called The Teaching of Jesus Christ on the Catechism of the Catholic Church is the only thing of its kind in the entire universal church. No other priest has done a series that in-depth, that broad, on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's 50 hours of video that synthesizes the Catechism. As if, what, what is this not important or something? We were mandated to do that. Every one of you has to know this. You've got to learn your faith. It's not hard. It's easy. And you bring it into your prayer life. Meditate on the scriptures. Know, know the basic principles. Read it as a totality. Read it in the light of sacred tradition. And third, you must read it applying the analogy of the faith. What's that? Analogy of the faith. Well, that's the coherence of all the truths of our Catholic faith that converge. You're, you know, if some, and you, oh, this is so valuable. For instance, someone comes along and, and, and uh, announces triumphantly, do you know? Mary had other children. Did you know that Jesus had lots of brothers and sisters? And you can say, ah, yes, I recognize that. That's uh, that HHM uh, theology. And they'll say, what? HHM theology? Yes. That's happy horse manure. <laughs> A very special kind of theology. Baloney. How do you know that? Hey, I know the faith. Which saint ever said that? Which father or doctor of the church ever taught that? How do I know that? I know, the, I, I, know the, the, I know the doctrine, number one, of the virgin birth. I know that Mary was conceived without sin. I know that she had one son. She had, she had a singular privilege. She remained a virgin before, during, and after the birth of her only son. You see, if I know that, simple doctrine, I can apply it to a thousand and one situations, and I can refute error. Oh, someone comes along and say, guess what? They found the bones of Jesus. <laughs> right. <laughs> or someone comes along and announces do you know that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene? 
baloney. Who said so? You know that lady Ruth I told you about? One, one time a priest was preaching, and he was of the theological uh, orientation of what we shall say is uh, somewhat liberal. And he was preaching, and he didn't make this up. He got it in the seminary. He said, now I'm going to tell you the real story about the loaves and the fishes. Uh, you see, uh, when, when uh, Jesus uh, supposedly multiplied loaves and fishes, he didn't, there was no miracle. Jesus didn't multiply the loaves and the fishes. You see, uh, the miracle was that he got them to share it with each other. No miracle. And Ruth stood up and put her hands on her ancient hips and said, so you over there? said so. St. Jerome? Nope. What biblical saint, what scholar of the scriptures among the ranks of the fathers, doctors, and saints said that? Not a one. Not a one. No evidence for it anywhere. What, I'm supposed to get my theology from some upstart theologian? Uh-uh. I want to know what the saints had to say about it. I want to know what the doctors of the church had to say about it. That's who knew. Why? That's who were most filled with the Holy Spirit. That same Spirit who authored the sacred word to begin with. It is only the Holy Spirit who truly knows Jesus. And the best way to understand the scriptures is to be holy. And you will be filled with that Holy Spirit. Like in this, with St. Therese. St. Therese went into a Carmelite monastery when she was 15 years old. And she died when she was 24 years old. And in that brief period of time, she became what Pope St. Pius X referred to as the greatest saint of the 20th century. Great saint. She didn't have much education. <clears throat> she, didn't, she really didn't have a command of the French language. She didn't have a whole lot of education, but boy, oh boy, did she understand spiritual things. How did she do that? Prayer. Simple prayer. Easy prayer. And boy, did it maintain her through hard times. She became a doctor of the church. A doctor of the church doesn't mean that you went to Notre Dame and got six doctorate degrees. You know, which it's a good thing to get education. Notre Dame or any place else, good, good. I'm all for education. But that's not what, it, what, what, what she had. A doctor of the church had such a, they have such sublime orthodox teaching that they instruct large numbers of the faithful. The various popes declared St. Therese as brilliant. Her teaching was so eminently simple that any child could grasp it. She really was canonized for her method of prayer, which wasn't really a method, it was called the little way. And what's the little way? Well, I'll summarize it for you. She was, by her own admission, a weak individual, incapable of doing the penances uh, of the saints, uh, she was incapable of doing the penances that her own sisters and the convent did. She was weak. She was sickly. I can't do it. She said, but I shall do little things with great love. Now maybe this is the most important thing I'll say this weekend, so I'll say it again. In your daily life, which is going to go just like that, you're going to blink your eye and you will be on the edge out of here. If you live a hundred years, that's the way it's going to be. Just like that, your life is gone. Uh, I'll tell you one of the unwritten laws of physics, and I'll guarantee you there's enough 
older folks here. No, I, I, you're not allowed to use the word old. Mature. <laughs> right? You and I are mature. We are mature people. Well, and we're all of that. The older you get, the older you get, the faster time goes. Anybody here want to refute that? <laughs> you know, I don't think so. You won't get any of those old folks saying that. We know it. You can't tell us any different. Man, when I was young, time seemed to go slow. The older I got, the faster it went. I'm 60 this year. I was 60 last month. Now, that's not terribly old. Some of you are older than that, but I'm going to tell you something. Now that I've hit 60, God, it flies by. Just the other day, I was five. <laughs> I blinked my eye, and I don't know what happened. The other morning, I got up. I happened to gl glance in the mirror on my way to the shower, and I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> Who's in my bathroom? <laughs> Who's that fat guy, that old guy over there? It's me. It can't be. I was a teenager yesterday. The older you get, the faster it goes. So, you know, just like that, we're going to be out of here. So work now. Pray now. St. Therese said, for me, prayer is a surge of the heart. It is a simple look. A simple look, turn toward heaven. It is a cry of recognition and of love, embracing, embracing both trial and joy. That's prayer. Prayer isn't merely, merely saying some words. Sure, vocal prayer, that's good, but that's not all prayer. You know, it was, off, it was said of St. Francis of Assisi. He, he, he was not so much a man who prayed, although to be sure, St. Francis prayed. He was not so much a man who prayed as a man who became a living prayer. That's what prayer is about. It's not just saying a few formulas. It's to become a living, a living flame of love. One of the stories from the Annals of the Desert Fathers that I like very much. A young novice went to one of the old desert fathers, one of the old hermits, anchorites in the desert. And this, uh, this old father was renowned for his sanctity. And the young novice went to him almost as much to justify himself and said, Father, uh, I say all my prayers at the appointed times. And three days a week, as is prescribed, I fast. And twice a week, as is prescribed by the rule, I keep vigil all night in prayer. And the saintly old monk smiled at him with love. And he said, but my son, he held out his hands. He said, why not become all fire? And his fingers began to glow like torches. Why not become all fire? Oh, but I say my, my little prayers. I do the, but why not become all fire? Why hold back on God? This life is going to go so fast. It's here today and gone tomorrow. We're all basically on our way out. We really are. And so why not make the best of it? It's not rocket science. It's easy. It is so easy. You know, I have found that this is one of the most enormous obstacles in, in trying to teach the faith. You, you know, and just trying to convey. I, I remember something my, the founder of our congregation said to me once. He said, you know, you don't so much teach the faith as you impart the faith. Now, that's something that has always stuck with me. Uh, it's not like, like teaching mathematics. You learn the subject matter, you give it back to the students. Well, that's a good thing. Teaching is okay. 
but with the faith, you impart it. You have to be filled with it. You can't impart fire unless you're filled with fire. Fire has a couple interesting properties. Number one, it gives off heat. Number two, it gives off light. That's the truth. The heat is love. Fire of love. Truth, light. Jesus is the light of the world. He's the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Why not be all fire? The mess out there is because of the mess in here. The buck stops here. I can't tell this bishop or that bishop or any bishop, do this bishop, do that bishop, do the other thing bishop. I can't tell the priest to do that. I can't tell the religious to do that. I can't even tell you to do that. I can only tell myself to do that. In the days of St. Francis of Assisi, the church was a mess. The church has been a mess frequently throughout the course of history. And it's a mess today. And the reason there's a mess in the church, that's why there's a mess out in the world. When we straighten this mess out, that mess out there will automatically get straightened out. Do you know why Jesus gave us the church? Jesus gave us his church to hold the very universe in being. To the, the, to the degree that we're faithful to our mission in the church, in, in a manner of speaking, we hold up the world in being. But you, know, you remember the image of Moses in the desert when the chosen people came into conflict with Amalek's army out in the desert, a pagan army? Moses went up on a height of land, as any good military commander would do. And Aaron, his brother, went up there and another priest. And it says in the Old Testament, so long as Moses kept his arms outstretched in prayer, the battle went well for Israel. But Moses, being a man and of limited strength, uh, his arms grew weary. And then, and then when his arms began to sag, because he was tired, the battle went badly for Israel. And, and so finally Aaron and the other priest propped up Moses' arms, and Israel won the battle. That's an image of the church. When the church has her arms outstretched in prayer, the battle against evil goes well. But we grow weary of doing good. We grow weary of prayer. And then what happens? Our arms sag, and evil has the upper hand. And so it is today. Evil seems to have the upper hand. Look at the world. Look at what's going on. All the evils. Look at the evils of abortion, euthanasia, terrorism. We live in insecurity. There will be no security in this country or in the world until we get straight with God. Immorality is on America and a threat to national security. Immorality is un-American. It goes against the principles upon which this nation was founded. And it is the biggest threat to national security that exists or ever existed. Until we get rid of the gross immorality Until we get rid of it, until abortion is no longer the law of the land, until disordered human behavior is no longer generally accepted human behavior, until we deal with that, there will be no security. It will go from bad to worse. People will live in fear. The country will begin to collapse 
under the weight of its own iniquity. What's the answer? The church, given by Christ to hold the world in being. How? One person at a time. The buck stops with you, and I'm talking to you personally, each one of you, with you and with me. St. Francis, or rather St. Alphonsus Liguori, another doctor of the church, said the man who prays is saved. The man who doesn't pray is not. You've got to be a person of prayer. As you pray, as you grow in your life of prayer, simple prayer, not rocket science prayer. And I'll talk about this tomorrow, uh, about the kinds of prayer. And, but simple, easy prayer. But do it every day. Prayer is oxygen for the soul. You know, you, you couldn't live a, a, a few minutes, naturally speaking, physically, without oxygen, right? You need oxygen. We have to breathe oxygen to live. We don't have oxygen, we can't live. We die. Prayer is oxygen for the soul. If you don't pray, you die. You know why so many of our brother priests are gone? They stop praying. And I'm not talking down at them. I'm not, I don't despise them. I love them. It can happen to anyone. If you don't pray, you begin to wither up. And you die inside. When you pray, vitality comes into you. And that vitality, that spiritual vitality, that oxygen, then goes through you to those around you in a mystical way to the whole church and through the church to the whole universe. And life is breathed into a dying universe. You were created to do that. To the degree you do that, you will have peace and you will have joy and you will become everything God created you to be. And you will go through life on the wings of the Holy Spirit. And you'll come to the end of your life. You'll pass through the veil from time to eternity. You'll stand at the gates of heaven. And there Jesus, with his arms outstretched, will welcome you. And you'll hear these beautiful words, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now at last, enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you.